was a little bit low. Mm -hmm. And you might want to do some more detailed editing than just what you can do with overdubbing and erasing and all that. And that brings us to the whole concept of step mode editing, that part of the record setup. Let's uh, go back to the original pattern and play it once just to refresh ourselves as to what it okay. sounded like. Okay, if we go into the record setup and select step mode, this is a multi-page uh, menu within the record setup menu. So in, in order to enter step mode land, what we have to do is press play. This isn't a confirmation yes, no thing like before. It's just we have to tell the machine, OK, kick us out of the regular record setup mm -hmm. and put us into step mode land, which is really kind of a whole elaborate thing by itself. The difference between step mode and real-time recording is the difference in song mode between assembling a list of, t of patterns as opposed to playing it all in real time. You were just playing a pattern in real time and recording it and editing it in real time with the erase button. But if you want to, you can also enter a part a step at a time, put drums in on specific beats, delete a specific drum, change a drum's volume, whatever, on a very microscopic type of level. This is also good if you're entering uh, a part from sheet music or something like that. You can uh, observe the sheet music and say, OK, an eighth note, I need to put in a snare here or a kick here or whatever. So it's good for, uh, for people who are getting started with reading music notation. Basically, the way step edit works is it steps through the pattern at the current quantization rate. Now, right now, we have the quantization rate set at 16, as the display shows, mm -hmm. because that's what we had it set at before. Because it was recorded at 16th note quantization, we know that there will only be drum beats occurring at 16th note intervals. We won't have any 32nd notes in there or something like that. Right. So we can step through this a 16th note at a time. Um, if you step through it with quantize off, then you have to step through 96 subbeats mm. per beat, which can get to be a little tedious. Right. So it's always best to choose the quantization value. Now, the way you step through are with the uh, page buttons here. Now it shows the next 16th note is empty. There's nothing on it. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to add something there, it's just as simple as hitting the drum you want. And while you're there, you can also vary the volume. Like you say, gee, I really didn't want it to be that loud. I want it to be like sort of a 16th slapback echo effect or something. Okay. Notice the cursor under the 8. Right. A cursor means that it's a value that can be changed. So let's give it a, let's give it a volume level of, let's say, 7 or maybe six, mm -hmm. or something like that. And you can keep on stepping through. Now here's one of the toms. Let's look, at, let's look at what the toms are doing. Also notice that in the right hand, the upper right hand, it's showing you what drum is present on that beat. If there's more than one drum on a beat, and you keep stepping through, it will stay on that beat until it's gone through all the drums on that beat. Okay, so for example, good. if you had a snare on here, the next one would show um, the beat, the subbeat, the volume, and the snare, which would be pad number two. So you can keep on going through. There's the kick. Uh, I don't like that, that soft kick. We need to have a loud yeah. kick there, right? So let's change the volume there. Um, you can also change the volume by just hitting the pad again. Like there's the snare. And uh, you don't have to enter a number. You could go. Or maybe you can't. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. OK. You're hitting it. I was hitting it too hard, right? Okay. I, had it on the, I had it on a response that weights it. To, to, to play louder sounds. Right. Okay. So that's, that's why I did that. Right, the velocity setting before, and I wasn't taking that into account. But as you can see, you can change it as well. It, obviously, this is a more accurate way of doing mm -hmm. it to get the different can volume you use changes. The, uh, up and down arrow keys as well? There you go. <laughs> so whatever you want to do, yep. <laughs> it's right there. And again, you can just keep stepping through and you know, insert things, change things. Let's put some claps there, see what it sounds like. So you can keep going through the pattern and then until you eventually reach the end and really fine tune something you want. If you have, um, oh, for example, a snare roll, it's going to be very hard for you to get precise volume levels. Uh, something like this, you can just uh, scoot ahead directly to where the roll occurs and enter the volumes you want to have it you know, rise up over time or fall back over time. Uh -huh. The other thing I find useful for this is um, if you want to create echo effects without actually hooking up an echo unit, like if you want to have a snare that goes, dum, 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 
Mm -hmm. You can step through and put a snare drum at the appropriate places where you want the echo to be and change the volume so that each one is softer than the previous one, which also means you can do strange polyrhythmic echoes and, and things like that. And uh, since you'd asked about it earlier, too, um, with odd time signatures on this thing, uh, it's not really an issue because since a pattern can be any number of beats, if you want a measure of 7 4, and followed by a measure of 13 4, mm -hmm. you know, you can just make one that's 7 beats long and then one that's 13 beats long. So you can just uh, do whatever you want in that direction as well. So step editing, uh, if you want to erase a, um, a drum, like, uh, okay, here we have uh, Tom 3, and that's at uh, beat 4 and subbeat 48, it's very easy. Just hit erase, press play, and it's gone. So just can, that one beat. Yeah, just that one, that one event. The only the event that's showing in the window right there at that time will be erased. Okay. Now, for some reason, it doesn't say press play for this operation. It's the only exception that I know of in here. Um, probably because this is really kind of a whole separate routine, this whole step editing type of thing that sort of follows its own rules. So that's, um, that's a bunch of things you can do. So you can change the drum sound volume in a given step. You can insert a drum. You can uh, delete a drum. And that gives you a lot of options. Sure does. To exit step mode, all you have to do is press stop or play or, the re or record setup again. The advantage of pressing play is it kicks you right back to the beginning and you can hear what you did. <laughs> OK? So I guess what the world needs now is an algorithmic uh, drum computer program to insert random things in step time. That's kind of a nice pattern. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you find out about those things. A um, couple other convenience features I should mention is copying. You can copy one pattern to another. Uh, like if you like this pattern, and it's essentially the way you want it, but you want to make some modifications, that's where the copy button comes in handy. Press and hold copy. Mm -hmm. The display says copy to pattern, and there's the cursor. And the cursor always means that the SR16 is hungry for data. <laughs> so you say, well, let's copy this to um, pattern one. And you enter that in there and press play. And now pattern one contains what was in pattern zero. OK. So it's now exactly the same. If we go, if we go ahead to pattern one, And again, this is particularly useful for copying fills, so that you could take the, a very basic pattern, copy it over to its fill, add in some nice little tom things or snare lead-ins or something like that, and you're covered. You can also copy the pattern of one drum to another one. So if you want to double, uh, for example, having a deep tom hit at the same time as a snare to get mm -hmm. a really deep resonant sound, copy hit the drum pattern you want to copy. It says drum D2. And then indicate uh, the pad that you want it copied to. Let's say 9, the tom. Mm -hmm. And then so it says copy D2 to D9, press play, copy done. And now when you play back the pattern, now that's making a much deeper tom sound. Uh, Elisa's calls it sound stacking. And what this means is that you can build up these monster sounds. Like if you wanted to assign maybe a different snare drum to this tom, you could have two different snare drums hit at once or two snares with slightly different tunings. And this really multiplies your options in terms of the kinds of sounds you can get out of this drum kit. Because now all of a sudden you're not just limited to a snare being a snare. Right. So that, that's, a, that's another great feature. You can even copy. Um, a part in one pattern to another pattern. This isn't something I do very often, so let's see if I get it right. I think you press copy. Um, you press the drum that you want to copy, where you want it copied to, and then the other pattern. Nope, didn't get that right. Maybe you press the pattern first, the drum, and then where you want it copied to, press play. Yep. Now this brings up an interesting point. I haven't used that feature in months. I mean, literally in months. But the SR16 is very forgiving. If you ask it to do strange things, it will just ignore it, mm -hmm. or you know, it will say press play if you're about to do something dangerous or whatever. It probably, you know, it w I've never been able to get it to crash by doing things like that. So in a That's case, good to know. You know, I knew it was one or the other. Either you did the drum first and then the pattern, or the pattern that you wanted to go to and then the drum. And obviously, the first one didn't work. So 
went Try to the second one. one. And that's something you'll find a lot of times. Um, and, you know, I, I know what you mean about manuals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not that I don't read them. I do read them, but I don't always take them to a gig with me. Right. And you never yeah. know when someone's going to say, oh, gee, can I copy that hi-hat in pattern 13 to the tom part in pattern 12? And you can do it. Okay. Uh, also, you can copy a pattern to itself. All that does is double it. Mm -hmm. But that's useful if you have, um, you know, if you have a pattern and, and you wanted to extend it. Uh, same thing with a song. If you copy a song to itself, it just doubles the length of the song. It just uh, appends it to the, to the end. Can you uh, extend the length of a pattern with uh, extra space mm -hmm. and then copy the second half of, uh, fill the second half of that extended pattern with another pattern? Uh, not really, because it deals with patterns on a unit basis. However, what you could do is program a pattern and just fill up the last half of it and then copy those drum parts over. Okay. You see, because remember, you can c copy individual drum parts from, or, you know, pad parts, like individual rhythms for one drum from one pattern to another. So if, let's say, you had a, a four-beat pattern, you extended it to eight beats, and you wanted to, like, have four beats of this great tom thing that's happening elsewhere, you can just erase the, uh, the first four beats of tom parts so you only have four beats left and then copy those drum parts over. I mean, you can get into some really abstract type of copying functions, but they're there if you want them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, again, it, it, you don't use them every day, but every now and then it'll come along and it'll, it'll really save you a lot of time or trouble. So that's the basics of the, of the step mode things. That, that's all clear. It sure is, yeah. So you have the real-time recording, the real-time editing, and the step mode editing. So you're, you're covering all those circumstances. Great. Now let's talk about the drum sets a bit because that's where a lot of the custom action is, too. Um, oh, and I, you know, I should say one other thing before. When I was talking about songs, um, I just want to emphasize that they can be combinations of user or preset patterns. All user, all preset, some preset, some user, whatever. Okay. You're not, there's no, no restrictions on that at all. Okay, drum setup, same kind of thing as record setup. You press the, the, uh, the drum setup button. Mm -hmm. You press again to get out. And you have a bunch of pages. The first one selects the drum set that you want to edit. Again, you have user or preset. The display will show user if it's user and won't show anything if it's, if it's preset. Right. And again, you, you call it up in the same sort of way by um, entering a number, using the up-down keys. The mm -hmm. same thing that you've learned before for everything else works here, too. So you select the drum set that you want to edit. Let's choose one. Let's just take, uh, oh, user drum set uh, two. Okay. And let's move on and see what options we have. Okay. Here we're on page two, as shown in the uh, lower right-hand corner. And we're looking at pad one, as shown in the upper right-hand corner. What's assigned to that is room kick one. Now each drum has its own individual number as well as a name. So you can remember it by numbers or remember it by names, whatever is more convenient. Again, select with the uh, up-down keys or enter a particular number. Now here you can audition the various kick drums. There's a real clean one, not a lot of ambience. There's one with a little more ambience, deeper, mm -hmm. fair amount of ambience a lower kick drum sound, and so on. I like this one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that one just really cuts through a track well. Yeah. Pure kick, real dry. Real old wooden type kick. Tuned lower. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of kicks in here. Yeah, there sure are. <laughs> so you get the idea. But it can also, it doesn't have to be kicks. Even though this is the kick pad, it can be assigned to anything you got in here. Remember, we're still going through kicks. Okay, now we're starting to hit some bright hall kicks. <laughs> now you might say, gee, that's an awful lot of, lot of kicks. But remember that there's uh, 230 or so drum sounds in here. So, you know, it's not at all unreasonable to have, you know, 30 or 40 sure. kicks and 30 or 40 snares. You have a lot to choose from. So that takes care of the drum assignment, and that, that's pretty straightforward. Um, if you want to pick a different pad, 
just hit it and it'll show you what's assigned to that pad. And then once you have the pad selected, as shown on the upper right-hand side of the display, then just choose whatever you want to have assigned to it. Mm -hmm. The next page is the volume. Again, hit the pad you want, like this closed hat or the open hat or whatever. You can see the volume change as right. you select a different pad. Like if you want a Mondo snare, there it is. So you can balance all your mix of the pads that way. Panning. If you notice in the display, uh, I mentioned that there were the two sets of stereo fields. And the panning here changes from left over to right. And again, you have your choices of using the uh, up, down buttons or the numbers. Uh -huh. Okay, and it, same thing. Choose the pad, choose the panning. Tuning. Tuning is variable from minus four arbitrary alesis drum tuning units to plus three arbitrary alesis drum tuning <laughs> units. It's not like semitones or anything. It's just a particular change in the sound. So if, let's say we take the snare. And for sound stacking applications, it's really cool to take like one snare, tune one up to plus three, one to minus three, and trigger them both at the same time. It gives a really, really huge sound. A brand new snare sound. Yeah, totally. And, uh, or you can put a, a, a set of tom in there, works real well, a timbali tuned down. I mean, there's, you can really go nuts coming up with all kinds of different drum sounds. Assign mode is a little bit complicated, but you do have ways that you can assign these voices to use up less voices. In single mode, each pad uses up one voice. However, there's also, they can also be grouped together. In a group, uh, hi-hats, for example, are often grouped together because you don't want to have an open hi-hat and a closed hi-hat playing at the same time. It's a physical impossibility on right. a real drum set, and that's one of the dead giveaways to somebody listening that it's a drum machine if they <laughs> hear the open and closed hi-hat at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So there's two different groups you can assign things to. Often, I said, the hi-hats will be assigned to a group and toms. Um, a lot of times people will assign that to a group because they'll be going around the toms and just playing one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's no hard and fast rule. But the advantage of assigning stuff to a group is that whatever is assigned to the group only uses up one voice. So if you have both hi-hats assigned to one group, that only takes up one voice regardless of which one is playing. Finally, there's a mode called multi. What multi does is if you re-trigger a drum, it will not cut off the existing decay. This is a realistic way to handle cymbals, for example. Right. Okay. Uh, when you hit a cymbal and you hit it again, the first hit doesn't just go away. It's still sort of ringing and hanging out in the background. Right? Uses up more voices that way because you have the one that's playing and the one that you've just played again. But it makes all the difference in the world in terms of creating a realistic drum part. So assign the hi-hats to a group to save one voice, and then spend that voice on getting the more realistic cymbal sound. <laughs> so that's what the assign mode is all about. Output. This chooses whether the stereo goes to the main outputs or the auxiliary outputs. And uh, pretty straightforward, whatever panning you had set will go to the appropriate outputs. Now this is, remember I mentioned earlier uh, that you could take something like the snare and the kick if they required extra processing and send them to separate outputs? Mm -hmm. The way you would do that would be Let's, uh, let's take the panning for the kick. We'll pan that all the way to the left. We'll, we'll, take the pan, we'll take the snare, and we'll pan that all the way to the right. And you notice that I used the number buttons to go from immediate left to immediate right, so I didn't right. have to go through the up-down thing. Now we'll zoom ahead to the output page, get snare again, assign it to auxiliary, get the kick, assign that to auxiliary, and, of course, it's not kick anymore because I changed the assignment, right, but you get snare. the idea. Right. Anyway, so now we have the snare going exclusively to one aux output and the kick going exclusively to the left aux output. So now we can run them through our, our MIDI verbs and, and you know, have this incredible killer snare ambient thing and, and maybe a slapback echo on the kick or something. And meanwhile, all the other voices are just doing their thing coming out the main stereo outputs. Real, real handy function. Okay, after you've done all this stuff, You've now created this drum set. It'll ask you if you want to save the drum set, and it will let you save to either the existing drum set that, you, that you've been altering, or you can enter another number. Mm -hmm. Now, if you try to, you can only save to a user drum set, obviously, because the preset one is in ROM and can't be changed. 
So, um, and also, the display will say that the drum set has been edited. Okay. So that's real convenient to know, too. You don't have to save it. Um, you can still use it, but um, in most cases, if you've gone through all that work, you will want to save it. So you can press, uh, let's say, let's save it to uh, drum kit number 34. How's that? That's a nice arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. And um, see, if you try to get it to a preset one, it just won't respond. Mm -hmm. It will only save to user. It says press play if you want to save it. Press play, drum set saved, and there you are. Now it goes back to 34 because that's what you saved it to. So now you're on 34 and you're ready to go. So that's the drum set menu. Very simple to do. Yeah, and you, get, you have 50 drum sets. So I think that what, you can think of them as, as synthesizer patches almost. You know, you can, you can build up a set, a collection of drum sets that you particularly like. Plus you always have the 50 user one, uh, preset ones. In right. there as well, so you you know you have a hundred old yeah Plenty. should 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 take care of you for a little while. Yeah. Now let's let's talk about uh, getting your controller into the picture here. Okay. Do you want to? Um, well, we, we maybe we should say uh, something about this this whole concept. <clears throat> the SR16, even though it makes a you know good drum machine and you can play it directly, sometimes you'll want to use it just as an expander module that right. you control with MIDI because. A lot of people are just going to be interested in this for the fact that it has 230 sounds. I mean, they could care less that you can program things, and mm -hmm. that they want those sounds to trigger from a sequencer or trigger from a, a drum machine, you know, uh, drum controller type thing, you know, Simmons right. pads, that, that sort of stuff. And um, so what you have here, uh, the, the drum cat, is a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated drum controller. Right. right. And, uh, you know, nice feel on the pads and all that pads jazz. Pads feel great, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's third generation stuff. You don't break your wrist hitting exactly. it, right? Exactly. Very forgiving. And this is, I presume this is mostly what you're going to be using with the SR16. Yeah, I want to be able to strike this. As you saw me trying to take my fat little fingers in there and, and write a drum pattern, it was very difficult to do. With this, I can pick up a pair of sticks and hit this and, yeah, and play in a comfortable way. Yeah, play like a real drummer. Now there's there's a couple of things you can also program of course using the drum pads. You know, you can program your patterns that way, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing to do. Or you can just if you're playing live and you want to use this as a drum set module and create some sounds, you can do that too. That involves getting into the MIDI setup menu. Same old protocol, hit MIDI setup to get into the MIDI menu, hit mm -hmm. it to get out again. You learn one button, you learn them all. <laughs> um, the first thing you'll want to do is set the MIDI channel that it receives over. You have uh, your options are any one of the any one of the MIDI channels one through sixteen, or Omni. Now Omni mode responds to whatever is coming in on whatever channel. If you were playing a sequencer through this, Omni mode would be a real bad choice because it would try to play your bass parts, your drum parts, your piano parts, anything that was spewing out of the sequencer. Right. Uh, in a situation like this, though, where you're just driving it with one particular thing, Omni works fine. Mm -hmm. And that way you don't have to worry about setting channel assignments or whatever. If you were using this with a sequencer, you would want to match the channel in the SR16 to the channel that the drum part was recorded on in your sequencer. Like if you recorded your drum, uh, drum parts on channel 5, you would set this to channel 5. But for now, we'll leave it on Omni because that makes it nice and simple. Sure, yeah. So again, this is page 1 down in the lower right-hand corner. Page two, drum in, off, or on. This determines whether the SR16 is going to listen to incoming note data or not. Such as the output from this. Right, so if you play right now, it says drum in, off, so you probably won't hear anything, right? Not a thing. Now this is, this is handy for a couple applications. Um, in fact, I'll try to describe some of the more esoteric stuff as we go along. There may be a situation where you want, where you have a part programmed in the SR16, a complete drum part, you want to synchronize it to a sequencer, but you already have the notes recorded in here. You don't want it to listen to any notes that are coming out of the sequencer. You just want to follow the timing data. Mm -hmm. In a case like that, you would make sure that drum in is off. On the other hand, if you didn't have a part recorded in here and you just wanted the drum sounds to respond to the sequencer or to a controller like that, you would turn drum in on. So let's turn it on and See if it listens now. I think I heard something there. I think I heard something there. I don't know which, whether we had the right notes set up or not. I don't think it's very ergonomic as a drum kit right now, but we are getting sounds. Yeah, we are getting sounds. OK. Well, that's what MIDI is all about. <laughs> <laughs> See if it wiggles and then tweak it. Uh, OK, page three. Page three. Drum out. 
off or on. This determines whether tapping on the pads will produce note data. You may want to program your sequencer off these pads, or you may not, or as it's playing a pattern, you might want to have the notes sent out. Uh, maybe you have another SR16 that you want to have double the part. That's a really cool sound. If well, you this, this will it. read uh, dr uh, drum in data. So I can uh, select a pad here, and if I strike a pad on SR16, this will learn that many note notes. Oh, so it'll automatically match the notes? Yeah. Now that is, that is extremely cool because so many times it's like, oh gee, what note is the tom? Let's see, the tom is MIDI note 56. Now how right. do I find MIDI note 56? On, oh, that's great. Yeah. So uh -huh. well, in a case like that, you would definitely want drum out on. Right. <laughs> okay. This is the actual MIDI note assignment for each pad. Again, as we've had in other displays, the upper right hand shows the drum that's selected. Mm -hmm. And this shows the note that it's assigned to. So this means, that, OK, pad 1 will be triggered if you hit MIDI note 36. Pad 2 will be triggered if MIDI note 38 comes in. And of course, this is assuming that drum in is on, right. so it can receive that. Right. And if you want to change that, uh, like if you want this to be 35, no problem. There you are. In fact, here's another, another useful tip. If you ever find yourself running out of channels in a MIDI session, what you can do is move all the drum notes down to something that's way below the audible range. So you can lay your flute part or something on, and so it responds to the higher notes, and the drums respond to the lower notes. Ah. And then what you do is you just set the, the flute part so that it has a note limit, and it just reads notes above a certain point, and the drum only reads notes below a certain point. So that's, that's one thing you can do with shifting notes way down. But most of the time, what you'll be doing is you'll be matching the notes to the controller that you're using. Working not with the presets on the drum machine. Yeah. Now, not all controllers are this sophisticated. Sometimes they will have a fixed output. In other words, this pad will only put out MIDI note number 26 or whatever. Uh -huh. And it's your responsibility to program these drums to match your inferior controller or whatever. <laughs> but that's what that function is for. Now. I should also add the sound stacking thing mm -hmm. I was talking about earlier. There's no law that says you can't assign two pads to the same MIDI note. So when you're driving stuff with MIDI, you can do sound stacking in the same kind of way. Have the tom and the snare drum both respond to MIDI note 36 or whatever. Right. So that's another way to do that. Our next page, now we're getting into timing data. Clock in, on, or off. If you have clock in, on, what that means is that if there's some master timing source that's putting out stop, start, continue, and timing pulses, that will be read by the SR16, and it will slave to whatever's coming in. It's a very transparent thing. You don't have to set it to slave or master or whatever. Mm -hmm. You just, it, if you tell it to respond to clock in, it will respond to clock in, and it will start, and it will stop, and it will precisely mimic whatever's going on at the sequencer. On the other hand, you can turn it off if you want it to ignore. Uh, the timing data. A good example of that would be is if you have a sequence recorded in here, you're driving it from a sequencer, but you just want to play back the drum sounds. Now normally if clock in was on, it would not only play the drum sounds, it would start triggering whatever sequence is in here and it would turn into a mess. <laughs> so what you would do is turn clock in off, so it ignores the timing data, but note in would be on, so it would listen to the note data. Right, okay. Clock out, on or off. This is basically the same thing in reverse. If you want this to serve as your timing master, clock out would be on. And when you press play on here, it will start your sequencer. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you press stop, it will stop your sequencer and so on. So, um, in fact, you can use it as a remote for your sequencer if you're so inclined <laughs> with clock out on. OK, let's move on to the next page here, MIDI through, on and off. What this does is it, with MIDI through on, it takes the incoming MIDI data that appears at the MIDI in jack, merges it with whatever's happening in the SR16, either internally or from you playing the pads, and sends the combined signal out the MIDI out. When MIDI through is off, the only thing appearing at the MIDI output is what's happening in the SR16. Well, with MIDI through on, you get both the input and the SR16 merged together. Okay. Program change on and off. This lets you call up different uh, drum kits, drum setups, through MIDI program change commands. So you can do that on the fly and actually change the drum kits. This is really useful. This is not so much uh, used for sequencing type applications or drum machine applications per se, but if you're using something like an external controller like the drum cat. I could uh, 
set up one of my pads here as a MIDI program change and change drum kits by striking that pad. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you can go from your uh, medium jazz kit to your John Bonham Memorial <laughs> kit or whatever just in a, in a song, right? In yeah. nanoseconds, yeah. you know? <laughs> so that's real handy. Um, and of course, if, you do, if your controller doesn't have those kinds of capabilities, don't forget that you can get MIDI program change foot switches designed mm. for guitarists. And you can uh, usually program them to do random access of program changes or a sequential combination, like call up uh, program change 34 and then 12 and then 62 or whatever. So that's a, that's a real handy feature for, for live drummers. Yeah, sure is. Now the note map, this is a, this is a really great feature. Um, one of the problems with a lot of drum machines is that you can only access the drums that you can play at that given moment. But it seems like a shame with something like the SR-16 that has all these different drum sounds available to only be limited to what you can play on the pads. Mm -hmm. So there's, a there's two different ways of mapping notes to MIDI. We already went through the traditional one where the, each pad gets its own right. MIDI note assignment and that's cool and all that. That's the one you can use if you want to record into it, if you want to play back. That's the most general purpose one. But there's a special mode. And what this does is this lets you take each drum kit and assign it to 12 MIDI notes. And you can do this for 128 notes total. Wow. Now, there's a chart in the manual that shows how the drum kits relate to the MIDI notes. In other words, it's, it's a fixed combination. Like one of the, uh, the, the, the last uh, drum kits, drum kits 40 through 49, are mapped in this sort of octave relationship. So uh, drum kit number 40 starts at the lowest MIDI note and then goes up 12 notes from there for the 12 pads. 41 starts at the next octave higher and maps out for the next octave, and mm. so on. So each one of these drum kits, see, notice that there's 12 pads. Right. There's a reason for this. <laughs> that's one note, you know, it's one octave's worth of pads, and it maps these across the keyboard. What this means is that you now have access to all these different drum sounds. Now, you can still vary which drums are assigned to the notes, but the pads have the fixed note assignments. So even though pad one of drum set 40 is always going to be mapped to the same note. It could be a snare drum or a tom or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So you still have some flexibility there. Um, if this is something you're, you're going to get into, rather than just try to explain it here, in the manual there is a chart, and the chart shows how all the drum kits are mapped out against the MIDI notes. And this is a, an incredible resource if you want to use it as, a, as an expander module or with a sequencer or mm -hmm. whatever to have all those drums available. The only compromise in this process is that you can't record patterns in that mode. Oh. In other words, this is designed for playback drum expander use only. Mm -hmm. But for that application, it's just absolutely wonderful. Okay. Okay. And that's it for the uh, for the MIDI setup menu. Okay. You know, when I was demoing this in the music store, uh -huh. I found that uh, no matter what pattern I selected, mm -hmm. I always had the same drum kit. Ah. Yes, that's, uh, that's something that has confused people before and confused people on the HR-16 as well. Um, the way drum sets are handled here, now you remember when we had a pattern selected and we called up a drum set, it called up a particular drum set that we edited and that was all, all well and good. Right. Normally to prevent confusion, what I recommend is that you have a one-to-one -one relationship between your patterns and your drum sets. In other words, drum set number one goes with pattern number one, drum set number two goes with pattern number two, because it gets real confusing if you start having pattern number one calling drum set 34 or mm -hmm. whatever. Sure. Um, so that's, that's basically the way that the drum sets and the patterns relate. However, there, uh, you should also remember that when you call up a new pattern, you automatically call up a new drum set with this kind of protocol. Now you may not want that. You may want to have, you may want to set up a drum set and then try out a bunch of different patterns to see how it sounds with them. Now every time you call up the pattern, it recalls the previous drum set. How right. do you get around that? Well, there's a final page on the drum set menu. If you go past the save page, which is page eight, you have a choice between set mode to pattern or manual. Oh. In manual mode, what that means is whatever drum kit you've set up on 
these pads is going to stay that way regardless of what pattern you call up. So what probably happened in the music store was that someone had set it to manual and neglected to set it back to pattern. Mm. So no matter which pattern you picked up, it was always the same thing, right? That was the yeah. problem. Uh -huh. Okay, so all you have to do is switch it over to pattern mode and you're right back again with the patterns being assigned to the, to the uh, proper presets. Okay. So that, that's enough. easy. You will find that that's a useful feature, though, because there are definitely times when you want to try out a kit with different patterns to see what sure. happens. Sure, yeah. yeah. So that's it for the, uh, all the setup functions. I guess uh, probably the next thing to do is to talk about backup. Boy, I tell you. Uh, I'm guilty of not backing up my patterns and working all night on a uh, couple of songs, writing some patterns, and then my data gets dumped and I waste all that time. I cannot tell you how many musicians don't back up their data, and they should never trust the microprocessor. I mean, you know, you never know what can happen. It's not that there's a problem with the product, but if you like, okay, you're, you're walking along the rug, it's a cold winter day, mm -hmm. it's dry, you touch the thing and you give it a couple thousand volts of static electricity, <laughs> You're yeah. probably not going to kill it, but you might scramble its memory yep. or do something like that, or you could accidentally erase a pattern when you're you know, in any frenzy of creativity or whatever. What I always recommend is back up whenever there's something you would hate to lose. You know, you really have to back up regularly. Yeah, but you know, I don't really like tape backups. I don't think anybody does. They're just very cumbersome. And <laughs> I know, they're cumbersome. You have to get the level set right yeah. and all that. There, well, there is a tape interface on the SR-16. And that, it does a real good job. I mean, it, um, you know, it's a reliable tape interface. Um, let me just give you a couple hints about tape interfaces if you, need to, if you need to use that. First of all, always use certified data cassettes. There's, audio cassettes are great for recording audio. Mm -hmm. They're not real good for recording data. Data cassettes are real good for recording data. They're not real good for recording audio. The most important thing about a cassette that you use for cassette interface is that it not have dropouts. Mm, right. You can afford to lose a few milliseconds of uh, sound when you're listening to a to you know a recording, but a few milliseconds of data is death to these things. <laughs> so always use a certified data cassette. There are some cassette recorders that are designed specifically for data storage and re and uh, you know saving and loading, mm -hmm. like a Radio Shack and people like that make them, and uh, they are in fact more reliable than audio decks generally, uh, okay. and they're more foolproof, but. You know, audio decks work fine. Surprisingly, a lot of times cheap decks work, work really well because you don't need a lot of high frequency response. They have a limiter built in, you know, because it, it's intended to be used for voice applications. Right, yeah. So the data always comes in at, at a consistent level. You don't have to be so paranoid about setting levels and all that stuff. So um, if, you use the, if you use the right kind of machine with the right kind of tape, practice setting the levels. What I usually do is I turn the level down to the point where it loses the data and it starts going crazy and turn it up until it starts losing the data because it starts to overload mm -hmm. and then set it exactly in exactly the halfway point and 99 times out of 100 that will be the correct level once you have that level you leave it set there and you're fine with tape stuff but there is an easier way and that's using um, MIDI system exclusive backup uh -huh. It's also more flexible because you can save, uh, it, you know, in just a fraction of a second without having to hook up all the cassette stuff. As long as your MIDI cables are connected to your to your backup, your your MIDI SysX backup device, you can just save a drum set, like you know, just save it to disk, um, or save an entire set of patterns or whatever. What I use to uh, to backup stuff is the data disk, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. the Alesis data disk, and what that is is it's a very uh, very simple device, although it has a lot of features that I, that I find particularly useful. One is that it will take extremely long system-exclusive dumps. And that's not an issue so much with the SR-16, but with a lot of synthesizers that are putting out uh, dumps of 100K or 200K. A lot of other system-exclusive devices can't store that. Uh, the thing about system-exclusive, it's faster than, than tape. It's also more reliable, right. generally speaking. What System Exclusive does is it takes all the patch data, or whatever portion you select of patch data, converts it into code that can be read as MIDI data. And from there, it gets stored on disk. And of course, because it's on disk, you can, you know, if you have some great set of uh, some data and your friend has a data disk, you can just bring a disk and, and load all the stuff in. You don't have to carry the drum set around with you and so on. Right. So let's, um, let's investigate how to do a SysX backup with the data disk. Okay, I think, great. I think that will solve your problems. Wonderful. Well, the first thing we need to do is make sure that the, uh, everything's hooked up properly. But it, it's real simple. The MIDI out 
from the SR-16 goes to the MIDI in on the data disk, and the MIDI out from the data disk goes to the MIDI in on the SR-16. Very simple. Yep, can't ask for more than that. Now, it just so happens I have a floppy disk here. How about that? That's already formatted uh, for, the, for the data disk, so I can just put it in. If it's not a formatted disk, you would just press the format button, and it would say, you really want me to do this? You press yes, and it's formatted. Um, so once we have the disk in there, um, what we want it to do is we want, it, we want the data disk to receive the system exclusive information. So there's this button that says receive. <laughs> Sounds like a good try, right? Okay. So you press receive. It says checking disk. Um, receive one sysx waiting for data. Okay. So now what we need to do is send the data from the SR16. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a backup button. The only button we haven't touched so far. <laughs> right. So let's touch that one. Okay. And we call it the backup menu. And the very first option is send out MIDI. Because they know that most people are going to be hip and save this stuff to disk instead of messing around with cassette interfaces. Great. So it's right there ready to go. To send out to MIDI, all you have to do is press play. It just says press play. Now, two things will happen. This will say that it's sending data out. This will be receiving data. Uh, but it's a very fast process, so don't blink. And here we go. Okay, now it's received the file. The data disk has received the file. Um, if I wanted to name it and go through all that stuff, obviously we could. Mm -hmm. But um, to save time, we know that it's in there. We'll just say that. And you would name it on the data disk, not yeah. on here. Yeah, right, on the data disk. So you could, like, uh, if you saved like 40 different uh, drum sets or patterns or whatever, you can, they can all have individual names. And I should mention, by the way, that you can also save individual patterns to the data disk or to another SR16. Um, if, in fact, if you have a friend with an SR16, you can just do a dump directly from one to the other not, and just avoid the, the step of going through the data disk. But you can save drum sets, uh, individual drum sets to the data disk. So you can build up a collection of hundreds of drum sets if you, if you want, or individual patterns. You can even take the individual rhythm of a particular pad and save it to the data disk and bring that into another file at some wow. point. But you'll have to read the manual for all that stuff. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll have to do it one of these days. So anyway, so now we have the, we have the file in there. And normally what, what you would do at this point is name it and save it to disk and mm -hmm. all that jazz. But um, what we'll do is, is I'll show you how you send it back. It's real simple. You don't have to set up the SR16 to receive SysX data. Like most MIDI devices that receive SysX, as soon as it sees something saying there is SysX intended for the device, mm -hmm. it will just go and grab it immediately. Oh, okay. So what we need to do he on here is, I guess, press send, right? Mm -hmm. Press send, so it says, it, just spit back the name of the file we, we put in there, send file at least as file 01, yeah, no problem. So I guess do yes is the next logical thing to do. Now watch the display on the SR16, and while it's sending the, while the data disk is, is sending the data, the SR16 will show that it's being received. Loading MIDI, just like that. And now all the data has been, been put back into the SR16. Now I saved everything. That was everything, the drum sets, the patterns, the songs, the whole deal. Wow. And you saw how fast that was. It sure was. And it's just, you don't have to worry about setting levels or anything. It's all just, just midified and ready to go. That would save me a lot of time uh, in lost patterns. The thing is, with backup, you've got to make it as simple as possible or you won't do it. Yeah. I mean, people who use 80 floppies to back up a hard disk soon discover that they should just go out and get another hard disk or a SideQuest removable or just something. Because if you have to, I mean, I never backed up my hard disk uh, when I had to do it with floppies sure. because it was just so time consuming. It is, it's tedious. You know, and samples and all that, it's the same thing. So actually I've used the data disk for a lot of other applications because it will take the long sysx dumps and mm -hmm. it's real convenient. So this, that's definitely the fastest and easiest way to do it. But there is all the tape stuff too mm -hmm. if you want to do that. So that, that pretty much covers uh, all the major features. If you, do you have any more questions about it? or? Uh, no, you covered most of it. Actually all of you covered. What I've discovered about this thing is that it, it's great for the, uh, the guy like me who wants to trigger drum sounds uh, in a live, live application or uh, write patterns from here if I want to. Mm -hmm. And it's great for the uh, single musician at a nightclub or something mm -hmm. or at a bar or a lounge who wants to really get a good feel uh, for his songs and not just be stuck to the the same old right. pattern over and over again repeating. You can just add a lot of feeling in there and uh, have foot switch control and uh, really make his gig work out real well. Yeah, the one thing I want to emphasize is that it really is worth checking out things like the foot switches and practicing with it. There are a lot of features in here. 
you can't expect to, to learn a machine like this in a day or even a week. You know, I'm sure that, that months from now you'll be finding out little fine points about things you can do that maybe aren't in the manual or that other people don't even know you can do. Um, it, there's all kinds of applications for the saving of patterns, for example. I, I, I could easily see that someday people will be selling data disks with, you know, hundreds of patterns for your SR16 or something like that. You just don't know where it can lead. Mm -hmm. So it's worth getting to know these things and, you know, play with them, play with the, the MIDI note mapping assignment. Really, you know, get to know it and uh, you, it'll, it'll keep you busy for a while. There's an awful lot going on in this little box. Well, great. Thanks right. for helping me out. Hey, well, good luck. Go cut, go cut a great demo. <laughs>
The samples can be triggered by MIDI over two octaves. Quadriverb now has multi-tap delays. You can combine with chorus and five-band EQ. Each tap has independently programmable delay time, volume, feedback, and stereo placement. Other new features in our major enhancement of the Quadriverb include dynamic panning, ring modulator and resonators, a, a vocorder type of an effect. All these new features and this enhancement are available in a user-updatable software EEPROM, which makes the Quadriverb Plus an even greater value. The new Datadisk SQ. The Datadisk is the professional standard for MIDI data storage and now has an internal sequencer which stores MIDI data in real time. It can play back stored data as sequences and is universally compatible with all MIDI gear. This major new enhancement is also user-updatable. 